Having a hero is not necessarily a bad thing, but idolizing that hero as perfect or infallible, that's where a society starts to develop its cracks. That's where we start to fail ourselves. We absolutely should recognize the achievements of those who came before us and the path that they paved to allow us to live the way that we do now. But when we place importance on them as role models, we fail ourselves and our children. We teach them that perfect champions arise out of our own ranks to save us from the metaphorical prisons built around us. Those heroes, even my heroes, made mistakes that should never be celebrated, but sometimes are. Having statues or monuments dedicated to these names erodes us as a people because we create an expectation that these names represent ideal versions of humans, a level of status to which we should all strive to achieve. But those heroes that we venerate in the modern godless world are more than often examples of some of the worst evils we have ever endured. It really would be better to idolize a fake god over a real man. In George Washington's home state of Pennsylvania, it was illegal to own a slave older than the age of 28 for more than six months. Yet every six months, George Washington would send his slaves across the border and back and say that this would count towards a new six-month period. At the time of his death, George Washington owned 123 human beings and then you carved his head on the side of a mountain. The Declaration of Independence is a great example of this disconnect between reality and the dream of a perfect society. My last video about the banks highlights the fallacy of the American dream, showing how it exists against a system designed to keep you struggling to survive. If all of your energy goes towards just trying to feed yourself every month, you'll never have the time to self-actualize. You were sold this system as an alternative to the iron fist of the royal power in Europe, but this dream was never actually meant for you. Are you crazy? You're nobody to them. But we're all created equally, I hear you screaming. The premise of American freedom was formulated by slave-owning aristocrats who wanted to rule a nation separate from the royals. They never meant for you to achieve power or to rule through capital. That's for the guys that they printed on the money. Politics is for the rich, my friends. Never forget that. The money literally tells you. The idea that you can grind to succeed is made impossible today with the mass accumulation of funds held even by just the wealthiest of business tycoons, like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and Jeff Bezos. Trickle-down economics was never really meant to work unless that was always supposed to evolve into working in a two-by-two -two foot cage for eight hours a day on a factory floor, being forced to urinate in a Gatorade bottle just to meet demands. The American dream is a why? You see it on TV so you think it can happen to you, but it only happened to 1%, and that 1% still has it all. Remember, this is a cartoon character, I wiggle him around on the screen to be silly. But sorry, th this one I don't think is going to be very funny. This video is going to cover a very frustrating and dehumanizing issue. And just as a disclaimer, this video is absolutely going to offend some people here. It's an it is what it is sort of thing. I think that when we get to that point in the video, you'll understand that I'm saying it the way that it needs to be said. But here's the hook though, just to make absolute sure I am not burying the lead. The 13th Amendment was passed in January of 1865, described as the final constitutional solution to slavery in the United States. It states, quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall be duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. I know that when you read this, it kind of sounds like it's saying that slavery is illegal in the United States. But read that again, my friends. Slavery is illegal, dot, 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 except 
for prisoners. So what this means is this sentence is actually saying that slavery is legal in the United States. Do you understand? Just because a sentence begins and concludes with a positive statement does not mean that that sentence is actually affirming that statement. So if I said, nobody here has a blue shirt except for Larry, then what I'm really saying is Larry has a blue shirt. Larry is a slave. This amendment actually legalized slavery in your country. As far as the law is concerned, prisoner equals slave. America, the land of the free? Ironically, no, the land of the most incarcerated people on earth. More than any other nation. Holy shit, you guys break all the wrong records. And think about the logic here. Slave labor is still employed in the United States today in the private prison system justified as punishment. Private prison owners functionally, legally own slaves today. And wouldn't you know it, several industries have become dependent on prison labor. Meaning there is now incentive for the prison system to create recidivism within the population. Basically, they have incentive to give convicts no choice but to return to the prison again, to be slave labor again. So if today we've got private prison owners encouraging their guards to beat the sh out of their inmates, then punish them afterwards with unpaid labor? Explain to me how that's any better than what they had going on in the plantations. One of the biggest justifications used in the slave industry was the Bible. Slavery is legal under biblical law, which is why the King James Bible was used to subjugate black people in the United States. The film 12 Years a Slave highlighted this. One of the slave drivers very condescendingly describes that a slave owner is allowed to beat a slave to death as long as he does not die that same day. But the Bible doesn't say anything about kidnapping an entire peoples from their land. It doesn't say anything about robbing disgraced noble bloodlines of their identity, selling an entire peoples down the Congo River and forcing them to adopt a new culture within yours, breeding them like their livestock, trading and selling their children off. Now, biblical slavery absolutely was evil, and I'm very glad that it was abolished. But there were several instances throughout a slave's career that they were supposed to be allowed to be freed, such as specific holidays, all things that were never recognized within the United States. We talked about the Lost Boys a few months back, but I didn't explain how the prison system factors into all of that. In a perfect world, we should not even have to deal with these issues in the first place. A world where we're all socialized normally and raised together as a big family. Instead, today we're institutionalized, separated from our family structures, pitted against each other from a young age, trained to struggle against a world in a system that was never going to reward us in the end for all of our hard work. Any kind of institutionalized education is going to be inherently abusive as its function necessitates reforming people's minds, teaching them to be functioning members of a greater societal machine. So often children are set up to fail right from the start. I mentioned before in my SNL video how impoverished neighborhoods in the United States have terrible schools and fail their students into the prison system frequently. This is the first tragic step to recidivism Citivism, the adherence to the system, and faith that it will take care of you and your family. The more detached an ethnic people are from the baseline or from the societal norm, the more abusive the institutional reform has to be in order to fit their student's mind into the cultural expectation. That's why all those native residential schools were so fucking terrible. Even if you could hypothetically hire teaching staff that wanted to be loving to the native children, it would still require them to commit cultural genocide and rob those children of their identities and their connection to their own history and peoples. Then the next step is the institution of the prison system, which we would like to believe offers some form of rehabilitation for its prisoners, yet we find time and time again that they are dehumanized, broken and abandoned on an entirely new level, all in the name of justice. 
I grew up listening to Snoop and Dre, Cypress Hill. Those were just some of the guys that taught me how to be a rebel when I was a kid. And sometimes I look back and I wonder how many kids ended up throwing away their entire lives because some of those guys told them to smoke weed every day. How many kids ended up stuck in the prison system forever because smoking weed is cool. We all took those risks back then. How did Biggie put it? Smoking blunts was a daily routine since 13. I was a fat kid smoking weed too. MTV taught me to be a rebel. It felt meaningful to understand that the world was fucked up and that we can rise above that, that we can rebel from that. The world first sort of woke up to this cultural issue back during the crack wars in the 80s when it was revealed that the Crips and the Bloods were almost pitted against each other over a narcotic that the CIA was intentionally allowing to be trafficked into the United States. The whole thing could have been avoided, but the black community was made victim to some other grand scheme that never paid off. And not one person ever saw consequences for that, except for the people who participated in the war. And this is not about drugs. I legitimately do not know anyone who smokes more weed than I do. I'm all for weed reform, and I think anyone currently sitting in jail right now for personal possession should be let out and have their records expunged immediately. In fact, you need major reform on all of your non-violent crimes in the United States. People get thrown into a pit to die over entirely forgivable offenses. But that is how the system gets you. That's how the monster consumes you, my friends. They try to trap you into adopting behaviors and attitudes that they can use against you. They can now cram you into an identity and hate you for being a member of that identity. And then when you act out of frustration against their unfair system, they can turn around and say that they were always right about you from the very beginning and lock you away for being bad. People get disappeared into prison systems all of the time for being undesirable members of society. You know this is true, and this is why the black population is overrepresented in prisons in the United States. That's the uncomfortable truth that no one is willing to say. But when you look at it from an outside perspective, it's impossible to see it any other way. Recently, Joe Biden signed an order that's supposed to end the privatization of the prisons and turn it into a federally run program which hypothetically could end a lot of these issues, but in reality could also just change the motivations and justifications that the prisons use to incarcerate people. It could just change the form of abuse and their motivation behind creating recidivism. The music industry has even been accused of incentivizing its artists to create works that encourage illegal behavior. But when people looked into it, it was revealed that several labels own stocks in private prisons and the way that a lot of these stocks are structured is they don't pay off unless the prisons are at at least 90% capacity. Rewind the video 10 seconds and listen to that again please. And this isn't about what music you listen to. I've listened to drill music too and some of that is the greatest shit I ever heard. The point I'm making I think is just things have changed, definitely. The guys I remember growing up with, they would talk about that stuff in the past tense. Like they're proud that they got out of it almost. Explaining how they became a product of their environment. But the modern guys, they're chaotic. They're in your face about it. There's constant gun noises in the backtrack. And they're making fun of guys that don't do it as well. They're making fun of you. If you don't understand what I'm saying about the demoralization of the black community in the United States, you absolutely have to watch the film Boys and the Hood from 1991. Lawrence Fishburne lays this exact concept out perfectly, explaining that the powers that be want you to be pathetic. They want you to be dependent on drugs and alcohol to keep you from self-actualizing, to keep you useless. They want you killing each other over chains and crack on street corners. You are playing directly into their hands. You are letting them own you. Pharaoh, oh Pharaoh. Let my people go.